Hi, I want to welcome you to the 11.30 a.m. Wednesday Lunch and Bible Study from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. We are currently in a series called Grieve Not the Holy Spirit, taken from Ephesians 4.30. Uh, this might be our fifth or sixth lesson in this series on Grieve Not the Holy Spirit. That's taken from uh, Ephesians 4.30. The passage we're looking at during this series of studies is Ephesians 4.25 through 32. You recall, if you've been a student with us, you'll recall that there are, seven, there are 11 imperatives, that's a command in the Greek language, uh, listed in verses 25 through 32. That's a lot of commands in a short period of time uh, in that. Paul is really laying it down on the church at Ephesus about the importance of grieving not the Holy Spirit. And we've been looking at all those passages, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. Today we're looking at uh, verses, we're looking at verse 31. Next week we'll close it out with verse 32. Actually, 31, 32 go together. So I'm going to look at them. I'm going to read them together with you. Uh, and notice the lesson title is Old Man Sins. I'm not talking about old man in the sense of a chronicle age, like somebody 80, 90, or 100. We're rather looking at a, a biblical or doctrinal term, old man. The old man sins. Here is in verse 31. By the way, that's, that's found earlier in Ephesians 4, like chapter 4, 22, 23, 24, which we'll study again today. But here's verse 31 and 32, 31 today, 32 next week. Let, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice Now, how many sins is recorded there? Let's go back and look. How many sins? Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice. Six. There are six sins here listed. And you might understand how deeply embedded these sins are in people. They've become part of a lifestyle. You'll meet people who are bitter. They're just bitter in their life. They're bitter. Or somebody, for example, where it talks about raft here, somebody who uh, is always mad, and it takes nothing to blow his lid for him to blow out and have an outburst. Uh, He's just in a state of mad, just mad all the time. Uh, he's always at a boiling point. The least little thing just flips him out. Or the word anger, which is a long, uh, uh, an anger uh, that has been in your life for so long, it has developed its own storyline. It's not a quick anger. It's, it's just a slow burn inside you of, of anger. The way, the way life has treated you, the way you've been treated, uh, yada, yada, yada. And it's not one of those angers that just can flip out on a, with, without a notice, and without even a thought. This is something that's embedded, an anger that's embedded, and it dictates your life in certain areas. That's the word anger in the Greek language. I wrote all these out in the Greek language, and the word clamor and slander and malice. i just trying to show you that these are deep embedded psychological sins. We call them mental attitude sins and sins of the tongue, but they're... they're they're, they, they're in the mind of the person that has them, they feel they're justified to have these. 
and they can use them at liberty when they want to. That they have a just cause why they're the way they are. Not true. It is true that they're there. And it is true that most people, the reason they remain there is they have justified them without divine consent or, or reason. And so we're going to talk about that today. If, if you're one of those people, if you know with one of those people, or if you live with one of those people, we're going to talk about that today in this text, all bitterness. Then in verse 32, and be kind to one another. See the antidote? You got it. You've got it. But he tells you something because the imperative is you got to put them away. You got to remove these. In order to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, just as God in Christ also forgave you. We'll talk about that. That's the antidote. You got to take, you got to put these away and you got to bring, bring, these have to be put off in order for these to have operational importance where these are part of your lifestyle. Changes. I hope you understand that. You certainly will have a good understanding of it by the time I get through with my lesson today. We have listed six old man sins, and you'll come to understand that term uh, today. All six of these are listed under the command, the imperative, put away. Put these away. Lift them up and remove them out of your life. Remove them from your life. And we're talking to Christians, not talking to unbelievers. We're talking to Christians. The imperative is demands volition. You must do this. It's a third person singular. Every believer is responsible to do this. These, these types of sins are no longer justified in your life. I know now you're, you're going you're gonna to go take your dog for a walk. And catch me on another day of when I don't deal with your package. Please don't do that. The Lord wants to have a meeting with you, a counseling session, to be able to get your life in a new order where you're more content, where you can actually, the, the word, be kind to one another, tenderhearted. Can you be kind to one another and tenderhearted and forgiving? Those who have did this, done this to you, or been a part of this being in your life where you're hurt and you're full of anger and, and bitterness, malice. You can't after today, I'm going to tell you how to do it. I'm going to tell you how to do it. First, a word of prayer to prepare yourself for the study of God's word that it has an impact upon our life. Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality, evidence of carnality, living in the flesh, satisfying the pleasures of the lust trends of your sin nature. That's carnality. How do I get out of carnality and back into spirituality? 1 John 1, 9. I like it because of one word, cleansed. The writer says if, in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, that's name, sight, and agree with God that that's a sin. The Bible tells you what sin is and what it isn't. Bible tells you today, list six. These should never dominate your life and the way you think and the way you behave and how you treat other people. Should not be there. You gotta, you've got to put them away. You've got you to lift them up and remove them from your life. You've got to remove them. How are you going to do that? You haven't yet. You're a believer. When you die, you're going to heaven. But you're miserable on earth. Because you got these things, you need to get rid of them. Well, carnality, evidence of personal sin. What you're told to do is confess that sin. And what we're going to do is to tell you that they've got to, not only do you have to confess them, but you have to lift them up and remove them. You have to pick them up and take them out and put them into the garbage. They're stinking up your life. Garbage man will pick them up. That's the work of Christ on the cross, by the way. So here, here's what I'm saying to you, that carnality, evidence of carnality is personal sin. What do I do is I confess it. He's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me. It takes me back to the cross. The believer, 
at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ where his blood cleanses us from carnality to spirituality. When you confess your sin, you're back into the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. That has to be done. It could be mental attitude sins like we got in our, our text or sins of the tongue like we have in our text, which are embedded in the Christian life where they are dictating the life to you. We need to address that today. We need to get this out of our life. I'm going to tell you, it's not as hard as you think it is. But you got to put effort, volitional effort into it. You're commanded to do it. You're commanded. I'm not, I'm not requesting it. It's commanded. It's commanded of me. It's commanded of you. It's commanded of every believer in Jesus Christ. It's a third person singular command. Well, let's go ahead and do that. I give you a moment. Mental attitude, sin, sense of the tongue, overt sin should be confessed in silence and privacy. Get us out of carnality. Get us back to the end dwelling for John 14, 26, where the Holy Spirit can teach and recall the word of God to your life, where great changes can occur that bring, bring a more contented person in his walk with the Lord. as well as with other people. Well, let us pray. Father, we're so thankful today. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God as we look at six deadly sins that are created in the old man complex of the soul of a believer that have to be removed, has to be cleaned up. And we'll talk about how to do that today. It'll always be done by grace. You're saved by grace, you live by grace, you die by grace. It's always grace. It's not by your own effort. It's by the grace of God. And this is something God wants to do, and God will empower it done. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're going to look at four aspects of how to deal with these old man sins as they're listed here. And the old man comes from, verse, from the fourth chapter, verse 22, 23, 24. These are sins that grieve the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30. Notice that Paul used the verb put away. It is the word iro, means to lift up and remove, means to lift up and carry away, remove. That's the word, and notice it's an aorist passive, you can't do it by yourself. God will do it for you. God will do it. You know, at 1 Peter 5, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. You don't have to carry these. You do not have to carry them. That's why Christ went to the cross, to carry your sins away. Even when you confess your sin is as far as the east is from the west because of the work of Christ on the cross, i.e. his blood. Not about your blood, it's about his blood. Paul used the verb put away, iro, an aorist passive imperative, third person singular, to show that it is each believer's responsibility to clean up his act, confess his sin, then he has the strength and the power within the Holy Spirit to lift these sins up and out of his life to put them away once and for all, heiress tense, once and for all. You may can't do them all at one time. You just, you know, hopefully you don't have all six of them in your life. Sometimes they're attached to get one of one or to get rid of two or three, but it's a process. It's a process that you should do. Now, here's point number one. What I found to be interesting about these six sins that are in a Christian's life could be, not in everyone, but there are a lot of Christians with these type of things in their life that uh, hinder their growth and hinder their ministry, their effectiveness with other people um, because of it. And so what I found to be interesting to me is the connection between Ephesians 4, 31, and Proverbs, the sixth chapter, verses 16 through 19. And here's, your, 
you might be familiar with it, but you will be when you go home or, or when you go back and read it. Proverbs 6. There are six things, he's, and he's going to list them. He says, this is Solomon, one of, the smart, one of the smart guys, right? Solomon. Everybody understands who Solomon is? Uh, the writer, the Hebrew writer of Proverbs. He, Solomon, uh, he says, there are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which is an abomination to him. So, the, and the, they have, preachers over the centuries have identified him. They call them the seven deadly sins. You've probably heard people preach on that. In a similar way, and, and what is interesting when you read it, I want you to pay attention to the human characteristics that are identified. In those, in those seven sins, in Proverbs 6, the eye, the tongue, the hand, the heart, the feet are all connected with these sins. He identifies them that way to show you they're part of man. The eye, the tongue, the hand, the heart, the feet. Be sure you see that when you read that. And then he lists false witness and he also lists the one who spreads lies. I just find that really interesting, the way Solomon identified the character of man, the character of a believer. These are the things God hates, and it brings an abomination to him. All right? In a similar way, Paul has done that. In a very similar way, Paul has done the same thing in Ephesians 4.31, in my opinion. He's done a similar thing where he characterized six sins of the old man that should not be in the life of a believer, but they are. And Paul says, you've got to get rid of them. But the, the problem is not that people don't want to. As a rule, they don't know how. We'll, we'll talk about that today. That's really important. If you have a paper... Uh, if you, if you drew down our notes off of our website, if not, why write these down? You have a pencil and paper and a Bible by now. You know that's required of you. You want to write down Ephesians 4, 17 through 32, because that's the greater context. This same idea that's taught in Ephesians is taught in the sister book of Ephesians called Colossians. In the third chapter, 5 through 17. You know, you're going to find these books parallel in a lot of stuff. So when you read one thing in one, you go, always go over and read in the other for additional information. The comparison of the, he talks about in both places, and they're important. Gives a little different view on them, but they all need to be removed. Okay? That's really important that you, you, you understand that. In Ephesians 4.22, this is really important to our study. Paul wrote in this section 17 through 32, he wrote that in reference to your former manner of life, and he used the Greek word anastrophe, and it, it means manner of life, a conduct, a, a lifestyle that in reference to your former manner of life, that's before you were saved, and you still have some of the problems from your former life still in your Christian life, in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside, eris middle infinitive, that's going to be important, the old man, the paleos anthropos, that's the old man, in Adam, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, we are all born in Adam spiritually dead. We're born again in Christ. Old man, new man. Old man, new man. And he says, what Paul is saying in Ephesians here, for your former manner of life, 
that you pick up things out of the world. We call it the cosmos diabolicus, the worldly thinking that Satan rules and controls that hinder your, the divine dynosphere of your life in Christ with God dictating how he wants you to be. This is the God world versus Satan world. Former manner of life, the anthropos, an attitude behavior thing that's structured in the way you live a lifestyle. Here's what he says, that in reference to your former lifestyle, manner of life, you lay aside the old man which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. See, the lust of deceit takes you to 2 Corinthians 11, 3, and the strategy, the strategy of Satan. He is a master deceiver against the word of God. He did it with Eve and Adam. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, deception. Very important. When, you, when you're still operating out of the old man of worldly enticement thinking, you are, as a Christian, you are being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. 2 Timothy 2.26, it is the snare, the trap of the devil to get you in to do his will. Just like he did with Adam and Eve. Oh, I hope you're getting this because I'm, I'm setting this whole thing up for you so that you could understand it and you could be free from this mess in your life. Disrupts all kinds of relationships. I mean, you get mad at somebody for no reason and you just cut them out of your life? As a Christian, uh, they don't know what's going on. Now, you got something deep down in you that has not been addressed, not been taken care of. It's a sin. I don't know. Now, remember, I told you that in Ephesians 4.22, the word lay aside is an aorist middle infinitive. There are three infinitives In this, pat, in this one sentence, Ephesians 20 through 24 is one Greek sentence. There are three infinitives in that passage that are dynamite. I wrote on the paper, note the infinitive, lay aside is one of three infinitives. The other two, the other two are re renewed, that's an infinitive in 423 and put on in verse four, in verse in chapter 424. Now look, verse 22, you got an infinitive. In verse 23, you have an infinitive. In verse 24, you have infinitive. Aorist infinitives. They are connected. They're in a series of ideas. Verse 22. Verse 22, I just read up here, in reference to former, lay aside the old man which is being corrupted. Verse 22, re be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24, put off the old man. These are all aorist infinitives. It's a series. This first, this second, that third. There is an order or a processing of doing this. And the former manner of life are things, are sins that you have developed or have been developed in you by your consent. Well, he's never going to do that again to me. Oh, boy. No other person will ever do that again to me. Oh, boy. Now, these are infinitives. Remember, verse, verse 20 through 24 is one Greek sentence. 
And these three imperatives, which are process, a series, first you take off, then you renew, and then you put on. Talking to Christians, this is something you must do. And it's a series of events. One Greek sentence. One complete thought. All three infinitives are connected with the verb taught, which is didasco in verse 21. When you look back up here at verse 20, this, this began, you did not learn Christ in this way, verse 21, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus, taught in him. This word taught in him is the verb that carrying these aorist infinitives All three are connected with the verb taught in verse 21. And it's important that you know being taught in verse 21. Now these infinitives, I'm going to read verse 20, 21 again because you're missing it. That's all right. Look, it's all right. It's, you know, you finally got with somebody, looks at the Bible, opens it up, actually reads it. But you did not learn Christ in this way, comma, if indeed you have heard him, listened in class and got what he said, and have been taught, in other words, I heard it, I didn't let it pass through my other ear, I heard it, I believed it, I'm implying it. All right? You have heard and have been taught in him, that's, if, that's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God inspired, you know, for inhale and exhale, that you have been taught here I am, that you have been taught. You did not learn Christ this way, negative, positive, but indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him just as truth is in Jesus. And then he gets to the sins of the old man. He says there's a process, three aorist infinitives. First, you got to, here's the process. First, you got to take off. Then you've got to renew your mind. Then you got to put on. That's being taught got to be taught to put off you got to be taught to renew your mind to the categorical doctrine you're dealing with and you've got to put on the new man you got to take off the old man by the renewing of your mind you got to put on the new man there's a process what it's a process man you can... i just i can only show you how it's developed here's how the writer developed it for us to understand it to get the simplicity of it also note that the two things that are exchanged by renew, two things are exchanged. There's an exchange. Put off the old man, renewal, put on the new man. See the exchange? By the renewal, there's an exchange. By the renewal of your mind, there's an exchange. The exchange is put off the old man, renewal, put on the new man. Without renewal, you got nothing going. Come on, this is a process. Put off, renew, put on. Verse 23, verse 23 is a key. Okay? Renew, put off, renew, put on. See the exchange? All based on renewal. The renewal is the key. Yeah, I'm just trying to tell you how this stuff works. You must put off old man divine viewpoint thinking, uh, uh, old man cosmos diabolical thinking. Now, if you want to look at that, you could look at 17, 18, and 19. Over in 17, 18, 19, it, you, get a good, you get a good look at that. Oh, man, this is what you got to put off. You get a good look at that. Then you have the renewal and after the renewal of your mind, the word of God that tells you exactly how you got to deal with it, then you got to put on. When you look at put on the new man divine viewpoint, then you're looking at verses 15 and 16 up above it. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all respects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body and he puts it all together. That's how this thing ought to operate. It's just a good way of looking at it, in my opinion. Uh, 
Now, here's point number two. So we've laid out the argument that Paul has given us. This is not my argument. This is Paul's argument. I'm telling you from a passage what Paul is saying. Here's point number two. We are first instructed. We are first instructed doctrinally to the old man in Romans, the sixth chapter, verse six. Knowing, which is the word gnosko, it means, it means, gnosko is really an average word. It means, it means to come to know something so that you understand it. And in understanding it, you have developed a relationship between what, what you know and who backs it. It's not just knowledge. It's a relationship between, between knowing something and what is known, why it is known to be true. Knowing, knowing is not enough. Listen, just, just knowing is not going to get all this done. It's coming to a place where you believe what you know because who stands behind it? It's a Romans 4.21 idea. Ganasco is a, a Romans 4.21. He who's promised is capable of bringing the promise to fulfillment. And so when a writer says, knowing this, it, the idea in Ganasco is that you have learned it, and you have learned that what God tells you, he has the capability to bring to roost in your life. I, I hope that makes sense to you. Knowing this, that the old man, the Peleus Antropos, who was crucified with him, was crucified with him in order that, this is important, the order that, in order that our body of sin that's all that connected to Adam's original sin of Romans 5, 12 through 21, might be done away with by the crucifixion of Christ, our faith in the gospel might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin by that bondage to the sin nature which Paul talks about in Romans 7, 14 through 25. Knowing that the old man was crucified with Christ in order that the body of sin, the bondage is broken, done away with, so that we are no longer slaves to it. You know why? Because we have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. The sin nature does not have a master. I'm not a slave-master relationship because I'm saved. I have a slave-master relationship to Lord Jesus Christ, which is a freedom idea, not a slave idea. Galatians 5, 1 and 13. The gospel of grace salvation, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Jesus died for, your, for our sins was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Romans 1, 16. It, the God, that gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel is the power of salvation, not, 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 not the person. The gospel. Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. When you believe that, the person gets saved. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Boy, you better learn that. The gospel of grace salvation resolves the bondage of the uns the bondage of the old man of the unsaved because it's been crucified with Christ. And the result is grace regeneration of 1 Peter 1.23 and Titus 3, 5 through 7. Well worth your read. Regeneration. Most people go to John 3, and I don't have a problem with that. You must be born again. That is the that is the principle, as long as you understand it's by grace of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And it results in man being a new creation in Christ. 
2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away, behold, all things become new. That We call that positional truth. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, church age, in the church age, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ, Galatians 3.27. That, that is by grace. That's positional truth. You are in Christ, and you will always be in Christ. Ephesians 4.30, you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You see, when you're dealing with these six sins, we're not dealing with salvation. We're dealing with a Christian life. Here's Galatians 1.13. Former manner of life again. You have heard of my former manner of life, Paul is speaking. Uses a word with the definite article 10 and the antrostope. You have heard of my former, he had a reputation in the church of a former manner of life that was detrimental to the church. You have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, an a religious unbeliever, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. Isn't God's grace marvelous? Oh, my. Oh, isn't God's grace marvelous? You need to let grace work in your life as it did in Paul's. You need to let it work in your life. Let the grace of God remove all of these things that cause so much anxiety and cause so much conflict in your life and relationships. Man, what kind of a relationship are you going to have when you have embedded hostilities like these six sins? My, my, my people. You need to have a former manner of life that you can boast on the grace of God in your life rather than live a handicapped, bondaged life in Christ. That's, that's terrible. It hurts my soul to even think about it for you. Again, Ephesians 4.22 in relation to Galatians 1.13, that in regard to your... See, we all have, we all have a former manner of life before Christ. And again, he uses antrostope, ana, ana, strope, that you lay aside the old man which is being corrupted. Now, I listed three things that are really important. There are three fronts in the Christian life that must be one. Three. After salvation. After salvation, there are three fronts. In the angelic conflict, the spiritual war of Ephesians 6, that must be won by you. They'll be won by Christ. But you have to participate. You know, fight the good fight of faith. The battle is the Lord's, but the fight is yours. Man. After salvation, here's the first front. Here's the first front that's got to be won. After salvation, the believer struggles before, be, between the sin nature, we call it the old sin nature, and the indwelling Holy Spirit. There's a struggle. And you've got to learn to always let the winner be the Holy Spirit, indwelling Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 and, 7, 16 and 17. Walk by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh, sin nature. These two are in opposition. There is a constant struggle in the life of a Christian. And the only person that can put that to peace and rest is you. you Got to quit walking in the flesh and start walking in the spirit. That's a choice. And the choice should be simple in your life. Quit giving in to the lust of the flesh. Give in to the lust of the spirit. You've got to learn to win that front. The second front you've got to learn to win after salvation is the believer's struggle between faith and sight. 
2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. You see, that's another one of those things like the sin nature and the lust of the flesh. You see, when you go there, you've gone, to the, you've gone the devil's way. Sight is the devil's way. If you read Genesis 3 and see how the devil deceived her, it was about what she saw in opposition to the word of God that she believed. When she saw a different view that contradicted the view of God, she, she went with it. That was Satan, the serpent, Satan, Revelation 20, verse 2. Come on. That's a struggle. That's a struggle that's got to be won. It's got to be won by faith. The one up here, he's got to be won by the Holy Spirit. The first one's got to be won by the Holy Spirit. The second one has to be by faith. Where does faith come from? It comes from hearing, hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We're talking about the faith cycle. You need to become familiar with the faith cycle. How are you going to walk by faith and you don't know how to do that? And listen, walking, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. That's only one of the four, four parts of the circle that make it click, that make it work in your life. There's the hearing, the believing, the applying, the completing. You got to learn that stuff. You got to understand the dynamics of 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired of God. All scripture is inspired. That's what the English says. King James says God breathed, and they're closer to it because it, it's, it's an example of inhale, exhale, taking the word of God in, giving it out like air. That's the faith cycle. One half of the cycle, hearing and believing, is taking in, breathing in, and applying and completing, ex exhaling. And what benefit is that to your life? Well, it is. The faith cycle is designed to make corrections in your life, to reprove you, to train you in righteousness, that so that you can be uh, fully equipped for divine production for God. In this life, in this world, you can make a difference for God. Would you like to do that? You can't do it with the sixth sense in your life that dominates you. It causes you to get on medications to cope, get on booze to cope, drugs to cope. What, what are you talking about? Listen, the Christian life is so more than coping. This is what Paul is trying to create. So here, after salvation, you've got to win the front on don't walk in the flesh, walk in the spirit. The second front you've got to win, don't, listen, don't walk by sight, you've got to walk by faith. You walk by faith, not by sight. That's the second front. You've got to win it. This, these are strategic in the Christian life. You're not going to get to where I want to get you until you understand it. Here's the third front. This is one where I am today. The third front, after salvation, the believer struggles between old man cosmos diabolicus thinking, the former manner of life where, the, where Satan and the world dominated the way you thought and, and chose and voted and did everything else, as opposed to divine new man, divine viewpoint, the word of God and how it's structured in your life so that you're able to put off this type of thinking by the renewing of your mind in the word of God and put on the thinking of God. My, my, my. You know, this is not brain surgery, but there are three fronts that have to be won. They've got to be won. Guys, you got to win on all three fronts. And when you do, your life is going to have impact in the world for Christ. After salvation, the third front that has to be won is the struggle between the old. This is our passage, Ephesians 4, 17 through 32. That's our passage. Or in, Col in Colossians, it's the third chapter, 5 through 11 for sure. Now here's the third point. The new man in Christ, the new man is commanded to stop being conformed to the world, old man divine viewpoint thinking, uh, old man cosmos di diabolicus thinking, and to be transformed, stop being conformed to the world 
and start being transformed by the renewing of your mind to the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. Prove it out in your life that it is good, acceptable, and perfect or complete. What, that's Romans 4, 21. What God has promised, he will do. He will do it. Now remember, I have told you that, Roma, uh, that Ephesians 4, verses 20 through 24, is one Greek sentence, one completed thought. When you go in there and study that, and, and I really went into detail with you on that. In verse 20, pay attention to the word learn. He says, you're not learning Christ this way. Verse 20, which goes 17, 18, and 19. Verse 17, 18, and 19 in your life, you, didn't learn, you did not learn this from Christ. This life didn't come from Christ. It came from the world. That's old man divine viewpoint. That's old man cosmos diabolicus thinking. Cosmos is the word world. Diabolic is the word devil. Now, listen, listen, this is important stuff. Pay attention to the word learn in verse 20. It's a negative. And in verse 21, pay attention to the word taught, which is a positive. Taught the truth in Jesus. And then pay attention to the change, the exchange Verse 22, 23, 24, the process, put off, renew, put on. Wow. I, I tell you, if, look, look. You may have to study this lesson several times to get it and maybe have to review it a lot before you arrive to where God wants you. But that's okay because learning is being taught the truth in Christ. And it's a process. This brings us to the importance of the consistency of inhale, exhale, of the taught word of God in the Christian life of 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 by the faith cycle. Now, let me wrap this up today. Point number four. Paul tells the church age believer, I call it cab. Paul tells the church age believer to lay aside his former way of life, old man cosmos diabolicus, by the renewing of his mind and to put on new man divine viewpoint thinking and behavior. Do not miss Paul's outline of Ephesians 4, 17 through 22. There are three things that are important when you look at that. For example, verses 17, 18, and 19 is one Greek sentence, one completed thought. And it's important because he's going, to, he's going to deal with it in verses 20 through 24, which is one Greek sentence. In verses 17, 18, and 19, in this one Greek sentence, Paul tells you to walk no longer as Gentiles, as the unsaved of the world. That's your former life idea of the things you picked up from being in the cosmic system. Your old man, Cosmos Diabolic, is thinking. In verses 20 through 24, that one Greek sentence, he tells you to lay aside your former manner of life. In verse 22, lay aside your former manner of life. It's still prevalent in your life in, in destructive ways. So you've got to, you got to lay it aside. You got to lift it up and remove it from your life. You got to put it off by the renewal of your mind. You got to put on in its place. When we get to verses 25 through 32, Paul used 11 imperatives. 
11 imperatives, 11 commands. Boom, boom, boom. Now he's into how to correct 17, 19 through 20 through 24. Now he's into how to, let's get it done. Seven and 11 imperatives. He uses the word, he opens up this whole subject matter with the words, therefore, which is working off from what he just taught in 20 through 24, especially 22, 23, and 24. New man, divine viewpoint thinking. And he tells us in our lesson to put away from you six deadly sins of old man thinking in the Christian life. Of the 11 imperatives, that's the 10th. You remember I said that was an imperative. Let me close by addressing again the six old man deadly sins. These need to be put away, lifted up, and removed from your life. He didn't say some. He said all bitterness. Dig it all out. Hebrews, the 12th chapter 15, talks about a root of bitterness. That's something that's been embedded. And you've got to get, dig it all the way down to the root. Bitterness, all of it has to be dug out and done. All of it, dig it all up. Dig the whole thing up, roots and all. Dig it all up and remove it. We're going to put a new shrub in. The word raft, I explained to you, is that person who stays in a state of boiling over. I mean, the least little thing, boom, there it is, an outburst of anger. He always keeps the kettle hot, always keeps stoking the fire underneath it, always keeping that kettle hot. So at any moment, boom, there it is. And everybody that lives around this person walks on eggshells, if you know what I mean. The word anger, or gay, this is an abiding deep embedded hostility. Often it, it, it is the idea of getting back, getting even, revenge. It's, these are very difficult to let go of when you have created a lifestyle out of them. Then the word clamor. Clamor is interesting because it's actually used as an example of a raven's call or cry. In all of the birds, this language, it's unique. If, if you've ever been a hunter, you know crows and the sound of crows and how they have a network of alerting within the forest. If you're a hunter, you know it. You pay attention to crows because they pay attention to you and the rest of the animals pay attention to them. They have a unique voice. The raven is of that family. And this, this word that's used for clamor is the, is the outcry. It is, uh, it is the, the cry of distress, fear and panic. The word slander is not really the word slander. It's the word blasphemy. And it's defaming God, Christ, the Holy Spirit as the Trinity or Godhead or spiritual issues, spiritual matters, uh, the church, the body of Christ, the Savior of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is defaming God or spiritual matters. When Jesus was dying on the cross in Matthew 27, 38, the crowd cursed Christ. It's called blasphemed. The thieves on the cross did equally. And then the final word is malice. 
Boy, you don't want any of the. Notice he separated them. Notice he started with all and he listed five. Then he came back and listed all again. He went all and listed one. You don't want any one of these five to hit malice. Malice. Malice is evil. Malice. Kadia, evil. It's wicked. It's concrete. It's, it's bitterness all mixed up and permanently set. It is, it is raft all mixed up and permanently set. It's anger all mixed up and permanently set. It's like concrete. Never want to get there. Very difficult to remove from your life. Could never do that. Well, I hope that's been helpful. Six deadly sins. It's how we would look at it in comparison to Proverbs 6 chapter. Let's pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we've told our people they must win on three fronts. They must walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. They must walk by faith and not by sight. They must walk as new man, divine viewpoint thinking, not old man, cosmos, diabolical thinking. We've told them how to get rid of these deadly sins, not let them to get to concrete. where they epitomize evil. Pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would cause people to study this until they get it. It's not likely they would get it in one setting. They've probably never heard this stuff before ever in their life. You got to study it and study it and study it. This is the teachings of the Apostle Paul. Not the Apostle Ron. I just carried his message. Encourage our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen.